video was originally recorded July 17th at the home of Robert and Nena Thurman. Uh, good, good, good afternoon. Today is the full moon day. A very auspicious full moon, I was informed by various authorities on the subject. Very good one. And so I'm happy to speak to you all today on a subject I think is very important, which is why does Buddha interest himself in politics? Why did Buddha interest himself in politics? And why do Buddhists, why should Buddhists interest themselves in politics? And uh, p politics, of course, my main interest in politics has to do with Mother Earth. You know, I don't care so much about two-party system, three-party system. I guess if there were a Green Party here, I would um, be probably a Green Party person. But uh, we do have a two-party system pretty much in America. And um, I don't really care whichever one. I have tended toward the Democrats because Republicans have been a kind of party for the plutocrats, more or less. And not, not Lincoln was not the case. In the old days, Republicans were not. But um, but lately they have become that. And um, so I don't care about that. But what I my candidate for president is Mother Earth and Father Sky is the planetary environment. Because, you know, the planet has taught us as human beings to take responsibility for our power, for the power of our intelligence, the power of our inventions, the power of our interventions and interferences with the environment. And, you know, we, we are used to, we're conditioned to believe by the religions, not particularly Judaism or Christianity or Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism, but all of them. We're conditioned to believe that we have very little power, that God has all the power, you know, or the gods have all the power. But if we read scriptures of all the traditions carefully, the gods are doing nothing but telling us to be responsible with our power, because we have tremendous amount of power, but we never really believed it. And in a way, maybe the whole resistance to climate change has to do with people who are afraid to really be powerful. And they don't want to admit they're in denial that the human being has the power to wreck the planet because it seems like it's so huge, the big oceans and the forests and the continents and then the molten core or the lava core of the planet and then this little planet and the vast host of stars and everything and that we little crawling, creeping human beings crawling around the surface, maybe flying a few planes, but still basically on the surface atmosphere and so forth, that we have actually the power to disrupt the entire mechanism of the planet. It's like, which means we have a kind of responsibility. Somehow our megalomaniacs among us like to say how we're so powerful, I'm so powerful, you know, I have a million dollars or a billion dollars, I'm so powerful. They like to say that. But the religions that then tell a man is nothing, made of dust, made of clay, like a, like a woman's rib. You know, and only God has the power. But actually, we invented these things. We've manufactured them. We were burning the, you know, the old rotten dinosaur uh, and the rotten jungles of the dinosaurs to burn as fossil fuel. And we are wrecking the entire planet. And if we let off a bunch of our nuclear weapons and the Chinese and the Russian and the Israeli and the Pakistani and the Indian nuclear weapons, we would wreck the entire all life on the planet. We were already, we were extinguishing many, many species as it is, just with our polluting and our overpopulation. And, um, but we could do it in, a, in 15 minutes in a thermonuclear all out escalated war. And, um, we could, uh, we, we are doing it with our uh, carbon pumping into the atmosphere and methane and, kind of, and melting the polar ice caps and things like that. Bringing on a new, like, ocean age, you know, flooding everything. So, so anyway, that's my main part. I just wanted to clarify. I want that my Bright Money campaign is for the planet, not for a particular party. 
It so happens the climate deniers seem to be clustered in one party and the climate um, green people trying to be green are clustered in the other. So it looks like it's for that party. But if the, if the few Republicans there were were taking it seriously, there are some who do. But the problem is there are no Republicans left, really. There's only libertarians have captured that party. And they're just turning, making them crazy, you know, to destroy the government. That, that's not being a party where you want to govern. When you want to destroy the government, that's a different. That's not the Republican Repub Repub Party wants to govern and maybe a little bit likes the upper wealthy side of people. But sometimes they have, they're, not, they're okay to wealthy people are okay. They're not bad. Usually they're generous and good. So they're a little bit in that side, but, um, and that's fine. But the libertarians are not on any side because they just don't want the government. So they, they're against government. So they don't want to govern. They, except they want to just be independent and control their own situation without government interference. That's their main thing. And that's what's happened to the Republican Party, which is not, is no longer is the party. So I just want to clarify that. Now, the larger topic I want to talk about is Buddha himself. What did he think about politics? And you have to realize Buddha was raised and educated to be a king. King means the commander in chief. He was of the Kshatriya caste, as it was in ancient India. The Kshatriyas are the warriors and the warriors are the ruling kings. You know, the Brahmin priest intellectuals were the advisors of those kings, but the kings had the actual power. So Buddha was at the pinnacle of power in his society. And he said, this kind of political power is not the most important power, but that means, he, but he was also attuned to it. And he realized that it did have a big impact on people's lives. And he realized the responsibility of people having power. From the beginning, he did. And he wanted, however, to have a, you know, as they said about him, he would have been a world conquering emperor, what they call Chakravarti Raja, wheel turning king, if he'd stayed as a, as a layman in a, in the household, in the palace, as a king. And then as a non king, he would be a Buddha. And then they, a Buddha is a Dharma king, they call it, a Dharma emperor. And, uh, it's a Dharma victor, champion, conqueror, you know. And what he wanted to do, he wanted, he could, you know, he was not trying to spread a religion. If he was only concerned with a religion, he could have gone back. His father would have been delighted and been the king as an enlightened king. And he could have sort of ordered everybody in his kingdom to adopt his religion. But he was not a religious founder. He was an educator and he wanted to educate all the kingdoms. Like if he had been an emperor, he would have ruled all the kingdoms. He wanted to educate all the kingdoms. He wanted, and therefore he wanted people to rule themselves by understanding the nature of reality and the nature of their own reality and others' reality by therefore developing compassion and interacting nicely with each other and things like that. That's what he wanted. So he did not uh, ignore politics at all. In fact, he cleverly avoided political role in a particular society. He refused adopting a political role in the neighboring society of Magadha. He was offered by the king there because he was a remarkable person. And he didn't take up his own original throne either. And yet he circulated among all 16 of the major North Indian kingdoms at that time, and even went to South and other places according to various in sort of magical ways, which we don't have to discuss right now, but he really permeated the, and he permeated the whole of Asia and probably he permeated the world even then because his influence spread itself to all the way through Persia to Greece. You know, the monasticism, the, you know, his uh, Sangha became monasticism in the West. You know, Jesus was undoubtedly influenced by him. If you read the apocryphal gospels with the whole idea of turn the other cheek, love and compassion. And the idea that, you know, that you have to take up the the role of healing others and you have to be loving of them. And God doesn't want you if you don't. God wants you to be responsible and this kind of thing. Within a theistic setting, Jesus is totally in tune with Mahayana Buddhism. There's no doubt about it. 
And uh, so in a way, the influence, you know, many, the Manichaeans were Buddhist Christians, you know, later by the time of Augustine. So it was, he, he, he made a huge influence. Now he's all over the world, except in the right, rigidly communist countries. And he's even underground in them. And um, he will be springing back in those after the purges that happened. And uh, his education system will be streamed, which is all he wants. He's not trying to take over religious authority everywhere, not at all. He wants people to educate themselves, whatever their local cultural, you know, system of religious worship and community gathering and thinking of their own local deity or their God as conceived as being specially favoring their community and so forth. He's not interfering with that. Although he's critical of the idea that any one of them is the supreme one, because then that leads them to fight with each other, you know, in a global setting, and that's not a good idea. So many crusades, and we can't tolerate them, you know. Okay, so, and he's, and when Buddhism can be made into a religion by people, and here and there it is later, and then they also behave badly a little bit, like the Sri Lankans and the Burmese nowadays are behaving badly as Buddhists, and that's no good. He doesn't like that. Buddha doesn't like that. But Buddha is concerned with politics. And his strategy of having people drop out and really forming the basis of monasticism and, and cutting across the caste system by, or by accepting people in the monastic community from all castes, thereby creating equality within, that, within his community, equality between people who were very hierarchically divided in the external society. That was a way of creating greater egalitarianism in the larger society, which had a huge influence, actually, and was resisted by the people, some of the people in the top of the hierarchy, and therefore was very gradually done, and he wasn't burned at the stake. He avoided being, you know, purged by these uh, people who, that kind of love-oriented and wisdom-oriented uh, education challenges people who want absolute authority over the lower caste, you know, the higher caste people. And they, they often kill the religion founders or persecute them, as you can read in any book. You know. And he avoided that by being much more strategic because he was a good politician. And then later in, Buddha, in Buddhist history, in Asian history, Buddhism influenced societies enormously, spreading the idea of nonviolence. The Buddhist monastic institution diminished military institutions in, in, throughout India and throughout the Far East. There was a seesaw in the Far East, of course, where the emperors would only tolerate it up to a point because then too much manpower would become monastic and they would want to draft people back into their army. So they would cut it back, you know, they would prune back the Buddhist popularity. It was incredibly popular. There's a wonderful book um, called The Buddhist Conquest of China, about, well, although it, it really, is, conquest is kind of, it's, it's, a, it's an appropriate word in a way. And of course, people wrongly think of it as a religious conquest, but it was an educational conquest and it didn't disturb Taoism and Confucianism, actually. It got along well with them. But, it, but the education system changed Chinese society, language, and attitudes enormously, actually. And it's probably why the Asian societies were conquered materially and militarily by the Europeans who were more backward in the in the last five or eight hundred years. Uh, first under the banner of Islam and second you know, the, the Mediterranean people under the banner of Islam, Arabs and so forth, and then the Christians under the banner of the British Empire and French Empire and so forth because they had become more peaceful over centuries because of the Buddhist education. And now the Buddhist education is filtering into the Western societies and um, and they are it is kind of threatening their militarism in a way. And you have a wonderful thing like the European Union and UN, which is trying to stop that militarism. And then there's a reaction against it, which is where we're in a kind of end game of it all right now, actually, in America and in Europe and in Russia and in China. You know. And... Um, so Buddhism has always been involved in politics and people who temporarily, of course, people will drop out from lay associations and they will be more open-minded about 
political affiliations, because their 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 main thing are like nonviolence, individualism, freedom, um, educationalism. You know, I have the my politics of enlightenment. People Buddhists who still think that Buddhists should have nothing to do with any politics. And once they are meditating, they should never go off the pillow. They should never go see anybody. They are not really understanding Buddhism. And they didn't read my Inner Revolution book, where I pretty convincingly prove that Buddhism is politically revolutionary in a slow and social way. Politically revolutionary, social, not violent, violent, bloody revolutionary, no. Buddhism even did interfere with regular religions in the sense of it interferes with sacrificial animal sacrifice or human sacrifice or animal sacrifice in any religious sense. It, it doesn't interfere, it hasn't interfered historically totally with meat eating and thereby the slaughter of domestic animals. And there are Buddhist countries where they do, they catch fish, they slaughter sheep, and they eat, they eat meat. Uh, many of them, although they feel it's kind of imperfect thing to do, and India, which was the most influenced by Buddhism for a very long time, so much so that it became unable to maintain its Buddhism because it became too gentle. Um, so when they were invaded by Islam, then they burned down all the Buddhist universities and monasteries. Uh, but it was the most gentle. It became highly vegetarian. And uh, the world will become more highly vegetarian if it wants to survive because the meat industry ruins so much vegetable protein to feed, make animal protein, and it's un, unhumane to the animal, but it's very also bad for the environment and bad for, leads to starvation for many people, and it's bad for agriculture. Uh, too much uh, meat eating, you know. And um, so, so it is political, and that means that nowadays when we're in this end game of the planet, of whether we're going to have a happy utopia of a peaceful planet, world peace, within which world peace we can all become really well educated. And by becoming really well educated, we'll become really happy. And it doesn't mean we'll become Buddhists. We'll be happy Christians, happy Muslims, happy Jews, happy Hindus, happy Taoists, happy humanists, if we don't want any particular deity. And, uh, but maybe a little more spiritual humanist than, than in the past. And, uh, and, but all educated about their mind and emotions and about society and about how love is the source of happiness and friendly to others and finding those elements in those religions because all the religions taught that actually, but not as efficiently and as educationally and as interdenominationally, let's say, as the Buddha's tradition. I, I won't say Buddhism here. It's the inner science tradition is what it was originally called. So that's why I'm into bright money, which is a political thing to get the world's population immunized to, to fake populist libertarians who just want to make money themselves and who want to wreck governments and who, but, but who, who do, to do that, they don't let on to the mass populations that their business is ruining the environment in which the masses are living. And, you know, cause bringing down on their heads floods and tornadoes and heat waves and droughts and ocean flooding, you know, and, you know, polar cap, ice cap melting and creating climate refugees of the masses, you know. So the campaign for Earth is a political and media campaign to let the masses know that they're being screwed over by the petroleum conspiracy, which is worldwide. It isn't just American oil companies. It's also the Saudi government, which is an oil company, basically. It's the Russian government, which is an oil company. It's the Iranian government, which is an oil company. It doesn't matter that it's a Muslim run. It's basically an oil company because they don't allow other kinds of beauty industries, happiness industries to flourish. And therefore, they, and they have oil to get money, so then they just do pump oil. And that's harmful to the environment. I mean, some oil we need, so that's a good, a good industry in a limited amount, uh, oil and gas. But until as we switch over to renewable, they have deserts, they have plentiful sunshine, 
They could have vast solar power industries, you know, if they would allow their individual creativity of their people to flourish, which they could do if they would wake up to the fact that even if they're living in a Versailles palace, if there's no water table left in France, they're going to have to leave and become a climate refugee from their $500 million palace. So their sort of money idea that that makes them immortal is not, doesn't work, you know, absolutely not. So that's a, that's a, that's a political campaign though, because it will be advertised on television and media. It will reach all the population that uh, climate change, climate over, global overheating, I like to call it, not just global warming, global overheating, the imbalance, the toxicity in the soil also, which is carcinogenic and is really bad for the sick, good for the sickness industry, bad for the health industries. The water pollution by fracking, terrible. It's like ruining water tables worldwide, wherever it's done. And then so soil and water, and then the temperature being excess, that's fire. And then the air being carbonized and methanized, and that's air. So those are all the major elements. That is, and even space being filling up with microwaves. This is making the world unlivable by sensitive beings. And this has to be known by the masses. And once they know that, then they will still have governors. They will still elect leaders. They will still admire leaders, but they will be discriminating in the sense of they will not accept leaders who are just serving uh, themselves and supporting industries that are wrecking everybody's life base. You know, the green planet, the trees, the grass, the food, the soil, the air, the wind, the water. This cannot be. And once everybody wakes up to it, even in dictatorships, they will make it known to the dictators. You, you, you guys will, we will not tolerate you if you keep polluting our lives and we keep getting sick and we can't eat and we have no water. Okay. And that's our duty within America, which is an exemplary country. You know, a lot of the technology and equipment came from here. Because although we are genocidal, we have been genocidal, we have been racist, we have been oligarchic, you know, anti-democratic, we have all those imperialists, we have those factions in our society, and we, are, we, and we have to work against them, and we have to keep trying to heal the people who are caught in those diseased ways of being, like male chauvinists, and uh, emotionally plagued, not to have pleasure in their own lives. We have to help them. But uh, we set an example. And if we collapse and have no control over the negative side in our own society, then everyone will give up everywhere. And then we'll have world wars. Then there'll be no protection. Then, uh, then we'll, there will be major chaos, Geo, geothermal, geopolitical chaos. So our elections are are actually, we almost don't have an electoral system anymore. It has almost been fully corrupted. There's so much voter suppression. There's so much misinformation in media, brainwashing, propaganda, and so forth, that we almost don't have a democratic system. So we're almost, this is almost the last shot we have if the current bunch of climate deniers continue, I don't call them libertarian climate deniers and sort of money obsessed people continue for another four years, blocking all things that the mass of the people want. Clean air, clean water, clean soil, you know, a good health, good food, you know, if they're blocking all of that for another four years, building nuclear weapons without control, undoing all arms control for another four years, undoing all environmental protection, another four years, supporting all the extractive and destructive industries, another four years, and uh, wrecking the judicial system so they can operate with impunity from that, which is just really part of wrecking the government entirely, 
freezing the Senate, you know, and, and making the executive into warmongering and self-destructing. If that goes on another four years, there won't be any more. We won't have a chance. And there will only ha there will be a recovery. I still, I'm not into doomsday. I think there will be a recovery, but it will be like the recovery after World War II. It'll be recovery after a massive catastrophe. This, this World War, World War III, will be result in the loss of billions of people, billions of animal species, millions of acres of, of polluted land, radioactive land. I mean, it will be horrendous, the reconstruction. It really will. Road warrior is not equal to the task of depicting what it will be. And the, and the people who, the, 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 the oligarchs who hope to get an Iraq and a Google Mars will not have time to really develop the cryogenic capacity of sleeping for a couple of years to get there. Won't happen. And then changing the atmosphere there can't possibly happen. So our dharmic responsibility of the next 16 months, our moral responsibility, not just our political responsibility, our reality responsibility, our enlightenment responsibility is to make sure that we are governed again by climate responsible, industry responsible people who will execute the policies that the majority of the vast majority, 87, 80%, 80% of the people want health care, 70, 80% want gun control, 70, 80% want no more war. I mean, it's, it's a huge majority. And, uh, the government should be governing and providing for the people what they want. And they're not unreasonable. They don't want to bankrupt the government. The people who have bankrupt the government have been the warmongers. I recently listened to one of the last few Republicans, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, who was Colin Powell's uh, you know, chief of staff for years, and who witnessed the government up close in the Senate and the Congress and the courts. And he says he's one of a handful of Republicans that are left. And the others are, are in the control of these libertarian money people. They've captured the party and they're not governing, as you have to realize. So they, and they don't, they, they haven't even taken a proper oath of office because they bankrupted the government. They spent seven trillion dollars since the year 2000 when they corrupted and overthrew the popular election of Al Gore, and then again overthrew and corrupted the popular election of Hillary Clinton, both of whom won their elections, actually. And they corrupted and overthrew them, voter suppression, computer hacking, whatever you want to call it, judicial interference, right-wing judicial interference. And they made wars, unnecessary wars, that have been going on ever since, occupations, seven trillion, five trillion already spent in the wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, wherever it is, Yemen, and two trillion for the, you know, budgeted for the veterans, completely blowing up the national debt, who they pretend they're so concerned about. And then two more trillion in the tax cut for only the top 80, 80 83% of which benefit went to the top 1% or top 10%, top 1%, something like that. So bankrupting the government, that's their job. They have a pledge to bankrupt it. All of those senators and congressmen who passed that tax cut, they had a pledge that they would never raise taxes on anybody to make the credit of the United States credit worthy which is in their oath of office. So they didn't, they, they did not sincerely take their oath of office. And so they they openly stated, but the media, they corrupted. So the media doesn't tell you that they openly stated by signing that pledge that they did not intend to, to keep the government strong and to make it serve the people. 
They were destroying the government, you know, drowning it in the bathtub, as Grover Norquist, one of their enablers of fake populism, uh, put it, drowning the government in the bathtub. So anyone, it's not because you're Buddhist or you believe in a Buddhist religion that makes you feel it's your duty to be political. It's because you're trying to educate yourself about your own emotions and not to be negative, about your ethical actions and not to be ethical, unethical, and hopefully not to, not to abet other people to be unethical and meaning destructive to others. And if you pass and sit out the last chance to exercise your moral will, then you're going against your Buddhist education. You're not fulfilling your Buddhist education. Even you're in a meditation retreat, you can go down and register and you can walk down and vote. Don't speak to anybody. Don't look to anybody. Get an assistant to just lead you, put a blindfold on if you want, and drop your vote in there. Have someone lead you by the hand and then go back to meditate. But you can be engaged even then. And of course, pray for the victory of the realists who are not in denial, not the denialists. That's the difference, not Democrat or Republican. It's realist versus denialist. Okay? So thank you. That's what I wanted to say today. And I wanted to wish everyone uh, encouragement, blessings. I think we're going to win. The ethics is going to win out. Ethics is not weak. You know, there are some politicians who say they study history and they realize that the, you know, violence has been successful in history, but actually it hasn't. Violence has always been a little bit of unsuccess, which then is repaired by people who are more loving and who make life worthwhile and livable and who are more happy. Because violence makes everyone unhappy, not only the one who's violated, but the violator gets unhappy, really. They don't enjoy it. It's not, it's not fun. Rape is not fun. Loving sexuality can be fun, but not rape, not just not killing, it's no fun. Playing music together is fun. Giving someone a hug and receiving a hug is fun. Smiling at someone is fun. Being smiled at is fun. Killing is not fun. Tiresome, wears out your biceps. In the old days, you had to wield a sword and now it wears down your trigger finger if you're sending a drone and it morally Horrible, because you're a gentle human. You were in the womb of a mother. You nursed at a breast, or you were held by a motherly being with a bottle. And you were cleaned and cuddled, and, and, and your tuition was paid. <laughs> and you know that. You depend on the kindness of strangers, and therefore, you don't want only enemies. You know that. So think of that. Think of... As Gandhi said in the movie, anyway, and I think he said it in his, in his wonderful book, Experiments with Truth, if you, there are some violent acts and some murders and some riots and some casualties and that missile strikes, but if you think of the vast tapestry of human interactions, and now we're up to 7 billion plus people, so many people don't kill each other, don't beat each other, don't violate each other, they help each other across the street. They bring, offer each other a cup of water. They're nice to each other. And that's the vast fabric of human life. And so think of that on this full moon. And my beloved Anthony William, the compassion at the right finger of God, the great healer and healing advisor says, you know, as he says, just love one another, have some celery juice, organic celery juice, eat some fruit, enjoy life. Thank you. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House membership community and the listeners of the Bob Thurman Podcast. 
To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership and the Bob Thurman podcast, please visit tibethouse.us or bobthurman.com.